Uh, welcome. My name is Alexis Rodriguez, uh, along with uh, Meg Mori and uh, Dean Peggy Chang. Uh, we work at the Curricular Resource Center to put on uh, theories and actions. So I just want to thank everyone for, for making it out. Uh, so now in its eighth year, 65 students this year will join a cohort of over, four, over 500 uh, seniors who have presented at Theories in Action. Um, theories in Action is an opportunity for students to be in conversation with each other, but also with you, with, uh, with the audience. Um, so to be together in a cross-disciplinary, diverse space, uh, it's a chance to reflect publicly on the social, uh, social significance of the academic, extracurricular, and community-based community projects and, and commitments. Um, in the back, there is a paper schedule. We, after this event, we'll only have one more one more event, which will be on Tuesday, so I hope everyone can make that too. Um, but yeah, so this is the, the roundtable politics of representation and social change, which is facilitated by Jim Amstatcher from the Curie Lab. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm gonna share with you a few of the themes that the panelists want you to be thinking about uh, today, and then we're actually gonna ask you to have a short conversation amongst yourselves. But first I'll share the themes have the panelists introduce themselves, and then I'll introduce the conversation that we're uh, hoping you can have to kick things off. Um, so here are the connecting themes across uh, all of the, the projects, the research, the work the panelists have done. Uh, first, how government influences how people interact with each other, how governments are st structured and how that structure impacts people's lives, and how people are handling and coping with the effects of policy. So keep that in your heads for a moment. I'm gonna ask a more specific question about that to kick off a conversation. But before we do that, we're gonna have the panelists introduce themselves. Start right here. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Sam Rubenstein. I'm a senior concentrating in economics and public policy. Uh, I'm originally from New Jersey. And after graduation, I'll be working at a progressive legal advocacy group. Um, hi, my name is Christine Baltazar. I'm a senior concentrating in political science. Um, I'm from Sacramento, California, but currently live in the Philippines. And after graduation, I will be a paralegal in DC. Hello, my name is Arely Diaz. I am originally from Los Angeles, California, and I'm a senior here studying ethnic studies and public policy. Um, and I'm happy to join you all. Excellent. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the panelists uh, have <coughs> Uh, the several connecting themes I talk oh, which are now up there. Excellent. So you can see the connecting themes up there. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I think it's uh, fair to say, especially after uh, reading over the panelists' presentations and hearing a little bit uh, about their discussions, it's fair to say um, that their belief that everyone in the audience here has their own perspectives and experience experiences about how institutions with power affect or impact your lives uh, and in reverse, how your actions shape these institutions. Uh, so before they share their stories and what they've learned, and their stories include research in Ferguson, Missouri, Egypt, China, Washington, DC, and all across the country, before they share their stories and perspectives on what they've learned, they're asking you to do a little bit of work first. So we're gonna take a few minutes, uh, have you chat with the person next to you, and if there's an odd person out, I'm gonna jump in the audience and chat with you because I would like to be part of this conversation as well. Uh, and we're gonna ask you to talk again quickly about how do institutions with power uh, affect or impact your life? And in reverse, uh, how do your actions shape these institutions? And just a heads up, we're gonna ask a couple of people from the audience to share a little bit about what they discussed. Um, so everybody clear on what you're gonna discuss for the next few minutes as you're enjoying those snacks and uh, getting ready to start. Excellent. So turn to the person next to you, get started, and I'm going to jump into the audience in case there's some other folks who want to talk. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. So yeah, institutions. Uh, I actually don't even know that we're going to do the discussion. Oh, uh, <laughs> so what's the question? Oh, so like, wait, so Victor, um, tell me about your research with um, like Maya Hall. Life. So for example, Maya Hall, and then how do you impact them? Done now. How do you impact them? How do you impact them? Yeah, how do you impact them? So it could just be like any example. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, but mine might not. Mine are like on the Besides, like, actually calls and voting. I've had few moments where I've had to kind of start numbers. So, yeah, many stories about how institutions with power sector lives or how they shape those institutions. I guess the organizations that people can be part of. Like, you know, when I put on the spot, my public good services people that aren't provided by institutions. So it's trying to come up. That's okay. Yeah, that's totally fine. Like, I had a hard time also, like, figuring that out. It's just really subtle. I was telling something about marches. So, like, have you guys ever gone to any marches? Yes, if they're educating. Yeah. Yes. Or like. And then I was thinking about that. that was, like, are really so in a like, right? so I had my lending my voice like, to whatever the march is, whatever subject of the march is. Or it's seen as, you know, going with whoever it's directing towards, I'm lending my voice, but also I probably didn't like it's a kind of tangible thing. But if you say, hey, it's less on your work because of a system that was set up, or partly got my voice to be amplified, right? The whole point of the author's point was that they it makes it seem like the market is going well. Mm. Like the market is <laughs> that's all why. Bad if it's like if the only programs we talked about is government tech programs are like the stigmatized ones. I mean, not that that's stigmatized at all. No, because there's like so many like very subtle ways the government think about the impact that you don't really think about. When I was thinking about like the public, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like even like when. To stop on a road and then you get to impact by like joining government or rallying and protesting. It's hard to kind of thing. It's hard to see the effect so far. And then on the other hand, if you look back again, I feel like you're like done research on the first question, like very few. Right. So I feel like people have done that. People are really making themselves sure, like some kind of thing to that effect, but like the way that our my mom had me no, my mom had me by that time, she was like 20 something. Dancing and everything else. Oh, yeah. But I myself to the to Oh, Which is hard because then it makes it. What do you mean, So, what do you mean? Oh, well, so like, so I talk actually about Egyptian revolution. And I had like a high school fascination learning about the topic. And then my freshman year, there was a freshman seminar on the social revolution. So I took it and I learned more about like the social war constituents and like the social power. So it's quite fitting because I do services internship with the government. No, I finished on Thursday. Yeah. Hi, but. Yeah, so then I wanted to look more into like social media slash internet in general. And then not uh, like, like coexisting fully that like allows for the government to sort of ignore the ideas of what, or like the issues of like, um, like class struggle between like the working class, Filipinos, and like, um, like the educated or is able to, um, by like performing like indigenous dances as like this sort of like prehistoric type of thing that allows for the government to like ignore the fact that like indigenous communities still exist today. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. something I've thought about in my own work. Dealing with America, because I feel like America, in, <laughs> in dealing with America. Well, as an American, <laughs> no, that, <there> is. <laughs> um, but you know, 
I feel like in a lot of countries like there is like a, like a, a, like a national like media or like a national cinema and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And America supposedly is more free because of the free market it makes it so that our media is independent from the government, which is absolutely not true, <laughs> precisely because of the connections absolutely. of uh, capitalism <laughs> with um, the state that make it so that, yeah, you know. You don't have to tell journalists what to say, but they'll always say the right thing. Um. <laughs> and I think especially like what government things, um, depend on whether or not people do certain things, um, like you were saying, that really influences the way that um, or that just shows how <laughs> well. <laughs> it depends. If there's just like affect your life. Yeah. If there's just <laughs> if there's just like one person um, who's like rallying for an obscure, not a very big topic, then it's not going to get a lot of like attention, meaning action, you know, from the government. But if it's like one person who all of a sudden like has like this really strong opinion, like and a lot of other people join that person, um, and like a powerful one, then that would cause for action. Um, yeah. Yeah. It also depends on if the government really wants, if it, it aligns with the government's interests. I feel like that would actually like, push for real change because if it doesn't align with the government's interests, then just like until like something really big like, happens and they're forced to do something. Yeah. I don't know. I also three or four more minutes and then back up. Good. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. How people in politics are actually like where it helps Yeah, we 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 were in the same Rhode Island government class. Yeah. Dumpy woman with a bad knee, a bad leg. It's like, well, what do you expect? You're getting old. Exactly. And I don't think that there's, you know, there's sexism. In other words, there's there's a lot of inequalities in a lot of different ways that that would also. I forgot to get the courts. I agree with you. Well, my court. I'm glad we're at that part. That 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 place. Solidarity. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask you guys, uh, um, thanks for taking the time to do that. Uh, uh, panelists, again, really think that 
you, you getting grounded and having these discussions will really uh, be important for hearing uh, their own presentations and what their uh, research is learned. Before I ask you to share a little bit about what you discussed just now, um, have uh, Liz introduce herself. Hi, um, <laughs> I'm Liz Gaccione, and I have studied anthropology and public health during my time at Brown. I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the trickle-down effects, basically what policy implications look like on a personal level in specific marginalized communities. So I'm very excited to be here with this panel. So what, uh, when people started discussing um, what things came up, and let's start with uh, what subjects came up when you were talking about how institutions with power were affecting your lives, if folks could just change it, share a couple of the thoughts, a couple of the subjects that came up. obvious thing is the government, but really, if you think about it, uh, we go from lots of, you know, we, we go from being under the control of one institution of power to various other institutions of power throughout our lives, and Matthew made the point that uh, maybe part of being in a, you know, what we think of as a civilized society is allowing yourself to be controlled by institutions of power. <coughs> Other subjects, other thoughts? The first way I, one's, at least I tended to structure that was, okay, the people and the institutions, but then um, actually you pointed out that even the people who are sort of aiming for change against certain institutions themselves have institutional and hierarchical structures. So mm -hmm. then they're, you know, it's not, um, certainly not just a binary and it, it makes the whole process more complex mm -hmm. and yeah so multiple we talked about multiple in institutions there not just government it seems like you guys were also talking about mul multiple institutions not just government other people talk specifically about institutions outside of government that influence your lives that have power that influence your lives of the Affordable Care Act is um, very much uh, worrisome for me. And um, my mom, who's pretty uh, apolitical, um, has been asking me a lot of questions about what's happening and asking me to translate what the debate is about um, because she knows that if there's a repeal of the Affordable Care Act and um, you know, she's hearing the term pre-existing condition. She knows that my young, younger son has one and that suddenly um, we might be affected. So okay. it's taken a very personal turn and she's paying att uh, attention to uh, the debate in a way that perhaps she wouldn't have. And what about how, um, uh, how you have been impacting uh, institutions yourselves. Did that part of the conversation, did everybody just start rip? Were, were the conversations mostly railing against power? That was what this group was doing, or what you were talking about how you're affecting change or thinking about affecting change as well? And just to keep going to maybe get others talking, I'm, I also talked about how I, in general, I'm feeling a sense of powerlessness given um, uh, what is happening at the national level in terms of um, repeals of, or, or the discussion for um, the repeal of certain things or just whose rights are being protected and whose rights aren't being protected and just considering anew what my political voice is or needs to be. I would just say that, uh, you know, those of us uh, up here are, are here on, on a, this panel with the podium and everything to present research, but 
I know that we've got people in the audience who've done incredible research themselves on this issue. I know Victor was, was doing uh, tremendous research <laughs> on uh, the way that uh, uh, shooting deaths caused by police are recorded or not recorded, and uh, how the way that you, you do uh, what you track in, impacts what we know and, and what we can learn and change, and that is a huge part of my research and what I'll be presenting. And I was learning about uh, dance in the Philippines and how uh, the way that it's presented uh, can be used by government to project a certain image uh, of the country to, to, to Filipino Americans. So uh, there's a lot of different avenues in this to explore and a lot of people up here, I think, who have something to add to it. All right. So before I let the panelists start, any other questions that you have or any other things you want to ask of the audience before you start sharing your thoughts and your research. I would just encourage you um, to s sort of hold that thought that Jim shared about not only how do institutions shape us uh, and exert control over us, but how uh, we might and how we do modulate within institutions. And just sort of hold on to that as you listen to the panel. All right, so Sam's gonna start us off. phone so I can keep some track of time and not let myself get too carried away. Uh, again, my name is Sam Rubenstein and I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day. I would have said trudging over here in the rain, but now I can say uh, spending time when it's beautiful and sunny outside with us. It's Providence weather for you. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to be, and I'm sorry that I'm so dressed up. I thought I was going to an event afterwards where I had to be really formal. Turns out I don't. So anyway. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the profit motive in courts, uh, which is going to look at uh, research in Missouri about how town's reliance on court fines revenue uh, created perverse incentives and how legislation to change that after Ferguson really impacted policing. Um, so what we're talking about is towns have town courts. Town courts generate fines via traffic violations and other violations. Um, and in Missouri, after Ferguson, something called Senate Bill 5 passed, which imposed a 20% cap on the share of a town's revenue that could be generated from this source. So I'm going to introduce the concept of perverse incentive, and I think this is why our conversation about institutions is so important, uh, because I talk about perverse incentive as something happening when uh, government has an incentive to, to profit from you. Um, if, if, if a town controls all of the revenue from its court, uh, then the marginal enforcement action could be profitable for the town. And that creates really problematic dynamics in terms of policing. Um, so thought exercise, Missouri towns keep 100% of the revenue that they generate through their courts. Uh, imagine for a moment how dynamics might be different if instead of the town keeping the revenue, they had to give up that revenue to the state. Right? It'd be a whole different set of dynamics. Suddenly the mayor and the council care less about it, but now the state legislature is pressuring the towns to give them more money. Right, And the way that that works might have an influence on what kinds of pressures the police are feeling from the town government in terms of what their enforcement priorities should be. And that in turn impacts how people who live there are experiencing uh, the enforcement regime. Uh, so, and I, I have at the end here, we're looking for a least bad way. Uh, I, I think that in the, we're not in a place to really, where in the political system, the idea of eliminating monetary sanctions in courts uh, is, is really in the discourse. And even if it were, that might be problematic too. Uh, if done correctly, fines could be an alternative to incarceration. Uh, but when used incorrectly, they're piled on on top of incarceration. And there's other you know, normative concerns about how to do it right. Uh, so why is this important? Let's take Ferguson as an example. Uh, in 2014, 23% uh, of the town's revenue came from court fines, which was not even the highest among its neighbors. 67% um, African American population, yet 85% of its traffic stops and 92% of its arrests were of African Americans. And at one point, there were 16,000 arrest warrants in Ferguson, which is a town of 21,000 people. So that's nuts. 
Uh, Ferguson got a lot of national attention for this, but they're certainly not alone. And I think we can think of this system broadly as a de facto regressive tax system, which imposes taxes on the most marginalized people in society who have the least political resource to oppose the taxation. And because it's being done by a different name, people don't recognize it as such. Uh, and there's a regime where if you are delinquent on debt to a court, and the, the way that, uh, that, that being enforced is you being incarcerated uh, to try to make you pay or you suspended your driver's license, then you can't get to work or hold down a job to make the money to pay the fine and you're caught in a, trap, uh, a cycle of debt. Um, so there's a real opportunity for research when this bill passed and this 20% cap, if you're thinking about this like an economist, that is sort of like exogenous variation. This 20% cap came down from the sky, could have been 22%, could have been 18%, but no, it was 20%. And we can look at how change around the cap, uh, what out how outcomes change depending on where you were in relationship to that figure. Um, it took effect January 1st, 2016, or the first day after the start of a town's new fiscal year. For most towns, that was July 1st. So we've got these early implementer towns, I call them, of January 1st towns and the, a later cohort. Uh, it also banned the practice of suspending driver's licenses to uh, coerce people to pay court debt, and it made it harder to jail people uh, for failure to pay, which is supposed to be unconstitutional to begin with. Um, and why Missouri? Uh, Missouri has extremely high quality data on its town courts, which is unusual. Uh, my home state of New Jersey, like 560 towns, I don't think that anybody in Trenton knows what is happening in any of those town courts, right? Missouri, unusual in that it has variation at the local level, but centralized data at the, at the, at the, 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 like the statewide level. Okay. So uh, inputs, what we're looking... I'll do it while we have it here. The outputs that we have are traffic stops, um, arrest warrants, and driver's license suspensions. And uh, those sources of data are from the Attorney General's office, uh, from the Court Administrator's office, and from uh, the Missouri Department of Revenue. Shout out to the Royce program at Brown for giving me money to pay the Missouri Department of Revenue to generate this data for the first time to be analyzed by anybody. So, um, and independent variable is just how much money's coming in. I'm looking at that both as in terms of a per capita amount and as a share of a town's budget. And some other things that I threw in were like, you know, the, the racial and socioeconomic composition of the town, uh, looked at population density because you might think that that would impact like how much towns rely on their police to do things like traffic ticketing. Uh, if there's like a small town with a big road through it, we'll see some of that. Uh, can put in data about tourism because tourists are easier to target for things like that because they don't live there and they can't exact revenge on you. Um, and home values, uh, which gave us an idea of like what the property tax base was. Uh, so I don't want to get like too deep into like icky statistics, but basically we're just looking at before 2015 and after 2016, uh, the change in the percentage of a town's budget that's made up of, of this revenue source. Um, and you could, you could rejigger this so uh, we could just, t we could start with, and I will, basically looking at how fines in 2016 are related to outcomes in 2016. That gives us just a, like a baseline of like, are these two things, you know, connected to one another? Or how fines in 2015 are related to outcomes in 2016, uh, which, you know, could tell us, you know, maybe we think that uh, a town is making its plans for enforcement in one year based on a historical trend of its revenue. And we would expect that uh, where... Uh, the share of a town's budget from revenue, uh, from court fines is falling, we would think that traffic stops and those enforcement measures are also falling. And this is just a second method that, that breaks towns into categories based on where they are in relationship to that 20% number. So I've got a variable for towns... Ooh, cool. Uh, I've got a variable for towns above the 20% cap, towns between 10 and 20 and all other towns. Um, this group though only involves about like eight, 10 towns, not that many. Where there, I've got like, you know, about 160 total. So uh, that is a little bit of a cause for concern in terms of the data. 
And I also, because the data on traffic stops from the Attorney General's office is so rich, I wanted to create a measure of racial disparity. So I define that as just um, the proportion of non-white drivers that are being stopped among all the stops uh, minus the proportion of non-white residents of that town. Uh, so a positive difference between those two things means a greater disparity between the non-white traffic stops and the non-white residents, a more racially dis disparate uh, distribution, and a smaller difference, or a, actually a negative difference would mean that racial minorities are underrepresented in traffic stops. <coughs> um, I'm gonna skip through this. So what do we see? Fines are falling over the period, which gives us some kind of like baseline thought that this law is having some sort of an effect. Uh, but I want to point out that the, the mean is way higher than the median. So by the end period here, 2016, the median per capita amount of fines is $16 or you know, 15 and a half. It's 45 for the mean. So there are outlier towns that are pulling the average way up. Uh, traffic stops are not moving so cleanly, which is a little bit of a problem for my premise uh, of, of these two things being related so closely. Um, warrants are falling, you know, this, is, this looks very consistent with a change in 2015 that made it harder <coughs> to use warrants. And here's our uh, suspension data, which I'm, again I'm very proud of because I only, only I have it, uh, which uh, the suspensions are falling. And here, so here's like the actual number of towns that are uh, above that 20% cap. Now, I, I'm not able to look at every town in the state of Missouri because the point where my data got a little bit choppy was figuring out how big a town's budget was to start with, the overall size of a town's budget. Well, not as easy as you would think to figure out because there's not one central place where all the towns say this is how big our budget is. And like really tiny towns like population 50 probably have crummy websites where they don't even post things like that or if they do it's like 10 years old, right? Uh, and the process of me reading for like two or three years of budgets from every town and state would be really like arduous. So I have a survey of uh, where towns voluntarily reported how big their budgets were to like a lobbying group that lobbies for town governments. Um, the responses to that were a little spotty, and I tried filling in the holes with some others. I would have liked to have, I would have liked these denominators to be bigger. There's about 450 towns with town courts total, and I've only got about 150. Uh, so what this is showing is that uh, this is, the blue represents the distribution of the percentage of a town's budget made up of fines before the law went into effect, and the red represents after. So you see that their distribution after is tighter, and you see that we have crazy outliers way out here. Uh, that is the town of Randolph, Missouri, population 52, uh, which has nothing but a huge highway that runs through it. 75% of their town budget from fines. Uh, and they were, when the state was making this law, they definitely had places like Randolph in mind, right? But the important one thing to note is that the average town is, is way below the 20%. The average town is, is less problematic. And this is a distribution of the change uh, from year to year. So the average the town, town did decrease its share of revenue after the law was passed by 1.3%. Um, the early implementer towns actually implement a little bit less, but there's a, they're a smaller sample size. Uh, and with some, I guess some towns had to make big changes. Yeah? Oh, okay. Oh, I think I have something. This is a distribution of a ra the racial disparity index. So again, being on the positive side means that uh, you're, you have, you're, you have an overrepresentation of racial minorities in your traffic stops compared to the proportion in a town. And the negative side means underrepresented. And I write, what's going on? Actually, after the law passed, stops, stops got uh, more, more racially disparate, a, a greater overrepresentation of minorities in traffic stops. Uh, 
I can't explain to you why that's happening. It's a relatively small effect. Well, uh, I, the average, a four a, a four percent larger spread between the percentage of non-white residents in the town and non-white traffic stops. So, like four percent is like decently large. I can only conjecture why that's happening. Maybe if we think that there's some sort of resentment about this new law trying to constrain this thing, or towns are feeling our towns are getting more pressure from the state about revenue, perhaps they're exacting that on people they think have less political resource to oppose their actions. I don't know. That's a conjecture. So, th like, there's crazy outliers uh, among this group. Um, so, the town with the biggest change that actually increased its, its share of revenue after the law was passed was the town of Licking, Missouri. Uh, population Three, uh, thir about 3,100, where about half that population is people uh, incarcerated in a large uh, penitentiary in the, in the town, right? Um, the town with the biggest decrease, Cape Girardeau, which is not a small town, uh, but it was doing that even as it was increasing its number of traffic stops 580%. Uh, so that is a little bit of a problem for my approach. Um, I told you about Randolph already, right? And there, were, there was huge variation on the racial disparity index. So Mount Vernon, Missouri, 2.5% non-white, 90% non-white traffic stops in one year. They have a big highway going through them. I cannot imagine for the life of me, it is coincidence that everybody they picked off that highway was a non-white person. Uh, but that was in 2015. By 2016, that, this gap was erased. And there are other towns that flipped the other way. I can't explain to you why that happened, but I think it's interesting. Uh, this I call gravity works. I don't want to show you too many of these output tables. They're painful to look at. But this is just saying that the fines in 2016 are related to the traffic stops in 2016. Uh, and, and, and the suspensions, the warrants, and the, the racial disparity, all of it. And it would, look, it would look like that also if you did fines in 2015 on outcomes in 2016. That could just mean, though, that towns are like relatively constant over time. Um, I couldn't show you that the change in the share of, of a town's budget from fines was related to the change in the, the, the uh, traffic stops or other outcomes. That's sad for me. Uh, I, I think I wish I had a larger sample size, like I said, and you know, if I did this again, I'd, I'd probably go about the data in a little bit different ways to try to fix that. Uh, what I could tell you is that being in that small group of outlier towns above 20% of their revenue from fines was significantly associated with declines and stops, warrants, and suspensions. So what it's showing is that if you were among the outliers, you did feel some pressure to make big changes once the law went to, into effect. And again, it's a small group, but it's, it's significant. Uh, sort of. Like, there's a statistical thing with robust standard errors. That's a problem for me. Um, and I also interestingly found uh, towns with younger populations had more racially disparate stops. Uh, more tourism and lower population density were associated with more stops as well. I think that this is the strongest piece of evidence I have to support the notion that this law had a causal effect on the number of traffic stops or other things that are being done. The top line is towns that were above 20% of the revenue from fines before the change, uh, and the other lines are, are lower shares of the revenue, and this is uh, war arrest warrants. And it's showing that those towns that were the outlier towns had a, a greater decline than the other towns. So that's, that's my best piece of evidence. The, unfortunately, the traffic stop one doesn't look as pretty as this. So it's, you know, it's a little snippet among the things that I have. Uh, so what we learned, summing up, fines are declining, so are warrants and suspensions. Stops are a little ambiguous. I saw you, saw you did the first thing that looked like a V. Um, the relationship between fines and traffic stops is less proportional than I expected. Uh, so maybe this, this, this revenue connection, my hypothesis that things are being very revenue driven was a little bit too pessimistic. Um, it's hard for me to say if the changes that I observe in my research are attributable to the law for sure or maybe to a changed atmosphere because I'm seeing a lot of towns that weren't affected by that legally binding 20% cap because they were well below the cap, but they're still decreasing. And I think that some of what that might be is that for the first time people were paying attention to this, for the first time the state government is looking into it, 
for the first time it's embarrassing to generate revenue for your town from this source. So even if you're not being legally forced down, maybe you want to want to bring it down too. Um, and there are some towns that are just crazy outliers in, in a not healthy way. Uh, I'm a public policy student, so I can't end without talking about policy recommendations. Uh, I think number one, the, this is I, this is a really problematic structure when a town can keep all of the revenue that it makes from this kind of policing enforcement, and that really needs to change. I think that my research maybe doesn't as conclusively as I, as I want uh, show that that changing those incentives changes policing, but I de definitely think I have some strong evidence to support that claim. Uh, and I some ways that you could deal with that. One is that you don't actually have to have town courts. There are a lot of states that don't have town courts. The state of North Carolina, for instance. Uh, the lowest level of court is county level, and the money that county courts generate from uh, generate goes into the state education fund. So that may be a good model, right? And you could think about how policing might look different if that were the case. Um, and I, we talked about this to start. And I think, so you could lower that 20% number down even further. I showed you that most towns are well below that, there's more room to go down. The law actually set the number lower for St. Louis County alone because of towns like Ferguson and its neighbors that were particularly problematic, and a court has thrown out uh, treating St. Louis County differently. I think that based on what I'm seeing, that so few towns are even close to 12.5%, which was the St. Louis number, you could do that statewide. Um, and more alternatives to find. Community service, make this, the, the law required that people who are unable to pay have greater access to waivers to not being forced to pay, that should be implemented. Data, 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 exclamation point. This goes to what I was talking about with, with Victor's research. Like, I would not be able to tell you any of this if we didn't have data. And I could tell you more if we had more data. And I can't, other states are like so far behind Missouri, I could not even imagine t doing this study about New Jersey, which I told you has really crummy data, right? Um, towns are not even complying with all the reporting that's supposed to be in existence already. So getting them into compliance is important. And finally, audit outliers. Like, there's no reason on earth that there should be a political division called Randolph Population 52 that's allowed to generate 75% of its budget from pulling people over on the highway. Like, that's crazy. Um, this, I think that the state attorney general's office should establish uh, a, a division which is responsible for investigating towns in the kind of very deep and probing way that the US Department of Justice did to Ferguson uh, after, you may be familiar with the DOJ report of Ferguson, which had national implications, really changed Ferguson a lot. Um, that should be happening not just when awful things happen, but on a regular basis. Maybe not even just to the outliers, but they could pick a random sample of towns and go in and say, let's talk with your police, let's talk with com the community, let's think about how policing is working or not working in this town and how to improve it. And I'm sure I went way over my time already, but that is it. All right. Any questions from the audience for Sam? Yeah. So I missed the beginning of your presentation, but um, do you have data that supports that if you were to implement those policies, then it would um, reduce the number of uh, people being pulled over on the highway or things like that? Uh, I do. I think it depends on which of these points you're talking about. The outlier thing, I think, would have a big difference. Because like, when I was talking about the mean being a lot higher than the median, that's because these outliers are really pulling it up. So there was, a, there was a point in time when the average person in a town was being charged $70 in court fines each year. It's a lot of money, right? So, and that's really being driven by the outliers. The, the median is only 19 so I, I do I think if you were auditing them, that would make a difference. Um, in terms of other things that I talked about there, uh, that's the, the the twelve and a half. I think I showed that you know with the average the average town being well below twelve and a half, which is the number they pick for St. Louis, uh, and with the distribution getting tighter after the law is put into effect, I think that you would probably still, if you dropped it from t down from 20, you'd probably still see the average town unchanged, but you'd see this right tail continue to creep in and creep in and creep in, which is what we want. I have a question, Sam. Yeah. Uh, so I think you gave some great recommendations, but I'm wondering what you see as priorities for future research and um, areas 
where data needs to be gathered. I was really intrigued by the idea of towns that flip flopped so dramatically. Yeah, I am too, and I don't, I don't have a good explanation for it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I wish I could have done that I didn't have time to do was interviews. Like, um, you know, if I just had more time, like I'd go to those towns that flip flopped so in such a dramatic way, and I try to figure out what the heck was going on. Was it just a fluke? I mean, they're not maybe not that big places to begin with. Um, something. I actually, I hope that my job allows me to have free time after I graduate from Brown that I can re-examine this in about a year or so. Um, one, because I think it's easier to talk about the effect of a law that's coming into effect in 2016, like another year or two out, like it takes time for things to work in, right? Mm -hmm. And also, from like an economic theory perspective, I can't conclusively tell you that it is welfare improving for a town to have fewer traffic stops, right? So if you think that traffic stops make us safer in some way uh, by reducing accidents, then you could think that there's some optimal point where we don't like traffic stops either, right? You don't like getting pulled over, that's bad for you, but you recognize that it's necessary in some way to keep you safe. There's some optimal point where we're doing just enough pulling people over to minimize the number of accidents. We don't want to go over that point because then we're just generating money, right? Um, I can't tell you that because I don't have data on accidents for 2016 because the state of Missouri is really slow in producing that data. Mm -hmm. They're really good at data overall. It's impressive that they have statewide data, but it won't be available until like the end of this year. So if I did this at the end of the year from now, I'd look, if I could tell you that traffic stops are going down in a town and the amount of money that the town is taking in goes down, but the number of accidents didn't go down, uh, uh, the number of accidents didn't go up, mm -hmm. then I've told you something really conclusive about did the town actually get better? Was the policy effective? Other questions? And I just had one last one for you because you got you guys got us all thinking early on about how we can influence powerful institutions, how powerful institutions influence us. And I share Peggy's comment earlier about feeling particularly power, powerless lately uh, in the political atmosphere. Do you think it would be a fair thing to say that uh, uh, teams of people just collecting data uh, about all the things that you're interested in here could actually be a way of influencing power in a, in a pretty effective way, as long as there was somebody like you on the other end ready to make sense of it and get the word out? Yeah. I mean, data is important. I think it's better to have it done by government in official capacity that's kind of standardized than ad hoc. Mm -hmm. But we would know nothing about, you know, shootings in this country without journalists documenting them, because we have no... Uh, sort of federal database of shootings. Um, certainly not by police, I don't think even in general. I mean, you can get homicide statistics, but uh, you know, I think that efforts by individuals to preserve climate change data right now, when its integrity is being threatened by the government, is tremendously important. Um, you know, so I, I think that if I'm a big, you know, uh, my like bleeding heart believer in the idea that we each have a little way to contribute and it's different for different people. If data's your thing, then you have a lot to add right now. All right. Excellent. Thank you. All right, thanks. start coughing I apologize in advance a little bit of a cold um, but again hi my name is Christine Baltazar I'm a senior concentrating in political science and I did this independent research on social media's impact on government constituent uh, government constituent interactions with two case studies the 2011 Egyptian Revolution and censorship policies in China um, so I conducted this research vis-a-vis -a, -vis a popular misconception that social media on its own can propel democracy in a nation. So, for example, in the Egyptian revolution, there was a lot of rhetoric surrounding how if you give people internet, then you give people freedom, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, and so I then engage with the question, how successful are social medias in improving or enhancing a state's democracy? Um, and I analyze it in two ways. First, by um, analyzing to what degree social media has instigated collective action amongst 
populous, like amongst populations and the government's response towards it. Um, and the second, two extremes of constituent government interactions. First off, the revolutions by the citizenry, so that's more of a bottom-up um, interaction, as well as censorship by the government, which is top-down. Um, so ultimately, I argue that social media is only an enhancer, not a guaranteed changer of political status or fulfilling democracy in a country, especially if it's authoritarian in nature. Um, and that's because of two reasons. One, social media, for example, has the potential to empower people because it does give people a space to talk and converse as well as share ideas, um, enhancing that sort of public sphere. But at the same time, it's not the sole method for improving democracy in the state simply because, well, social media has a lot of limitations. Whether you look at like internet penetration in a country is quite varied. Um, as well as like access to social media if you don't have a computer, if you don't have cell phones, etc. Oh there we go. Um, so some key concepts before I kind of proceed in my presentation. One is social networking sites, SNSs. So those are your millennial tools of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of that. Um, in com um, in con conjunction with information communication technologies, which are ICTs. So that's your radio, um, your cell phones, usually your smartphones, television. So a combination of those two provide the user experience for social media and for constituents to interact with those <clears throat> type of technologies. And then this, the, I guess the largest concept that I do play with in both of my case studies is the concept of the public sphere, um, which was created by Jürgen Habermas who's this German sociologist and philosopher. And in his concept, he discusses that in the 18th century, there was this new era of communication um, because of the development of common spaces such as taverns and coffee houses. So if you imagine like, for example, the French Revolution, um, you can imagine like an old tavern with like old white men like conversing their ideas, et cetera, and how to revol revolt. Um, and so although it's like a 18th century concept, um, that actually still relates quite uh, appropriately to today's type of uh, public sphere. So for example, we have this type of tavern, you know, where you converse, et cetera, but you can also have this type of social space where you have a thread of Twitter um, feeds, et cetera, of people just conversing um, and connecting with one another, as well as this type of public sphere with comments. So in essence, the 21st century version of the public sphere has expanded, um, it has transcended um, geographical barriers, um, etc. Um, and so in my research, I also go over pros and cons of social media. A few of them are listed here. Um, these actually decrease transaction costs of communication um, simply because of one, like higher speed communication, like instantly, click of the button, you can send out whatever you want, as well as receive feedback. Um, second, increased free speech. So there's a little bit of a caveat to this, simply because if you organically look at social media, yes, there is minimal regulation, but if you add stuff like censorship and certain um, barriers such as that, it doesn't necessarily mean you have free speech. But the organic sense you do. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The third point is no cost to join platforms, so it kind of does decrease that um, economic barrier in the sense that there are no entry level fees to join Facebook, but um, a little bit of an asterisk, you still do need to have the smartphone, the internet subscription, the laptop, etc., in order to engage in these civil society tools. And finally, the most important part and the most innovative part of social media and internet in general, which is I, I guess I'm most excited for as a millennial, is simply because um, it does provide a global community um, and a global network. So the user experience of constituents, etc., is more globalized and it increases the amount of reach for communication and information um, transfer. Um, although there are many cons, um, it's just for time restraint, uh, I will just go into one major one, which is internet penetration. Uh, these graphs I kind of made on Photoshop, so forgive me if the proportions are a little bit off for you STEM majors um, in the room. But um, if you think about um, internet access, comparing the United States, there's 88.2%. So that's like eh, about, or, yeah, about like eight or nine out of 10 people have access to internet. But if you go to places like China or Egypt, where then you have like 52.2%, that's like five out of 10 people. But if you go to like 
Egypt, then you, like if you sit, stand next to someone, there's seven out of 10 chances that that person might not be connected to the internet. And that has so many implications on the power of social media because it decreases its potency, especially if you're evoking change. Um, yeah. <coughs> so going into my first case study, um, the Egyptian revolution. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the details of the revolution, it started on January 25th, 2011, and it was a protest against poverty, unemployment, as well as the oppressive rule of President Hosni Mubarak, who had at that time had almost been in about three decades of power. Um, and so in essence, people took to the streets of downtown Cairo um, on Tahrir Square, and there was this um, a lot of chaotic pushback between the protesters on the ground as well as the police, um, they used a lot of really harsh methods like tear gas to disperse the crowds. Um, but oh no. But in, uh, it ultimately concluded on February 14th, 2011 um, with a signed agreement as well as with the ousting of Hosni Mubarak. So a few things about social media in Egypt. Actually, the Arab Spring itself was a big proponent of um, social media mobilizing people. So for example, um, the first part of the Arab Spring uh, occurred in Tunisia, um, and they kind of claimed that it used to be like the Twitter revolution, and that's how they um, which ousted their own president, Ben Ali. And so that influenced Egypt um, and its Twitter usage. So for example, it po they popularized the hashtag Jan25, which is, the, of course, the first day of the revolution. Um, and during my research, I kind of uh, worked with this Tahrir data set project, um, and they saw that there were 675,000 tweets um, with the hashtag Jan25, uh, 107,000 us us users um, put this out there, but that's just hashtag Jan25. That doesn't even include hashtag January25, doesn't include hashtag Egypt. Hashtag Egypt actually had 1.4 million users use it. So just like this, overall volume of Twitter discussion um, using these um, modern methods to kind of tag things and to kind of like find other people who've also used hashtag Jam25 in order to mobilize is such a powerful, um, powerful tool. Another really interesting tool that was used was Facebook. Um, so fun fact, uh, it still is too, Egypt is the highest amount of Facebook users in the Middle Eastern region. Um, and one of the, I guess, the biggest proponents of social media in its usage in the Egyptian revolution was this Facebook page called We Are All Khalid Said. And Khalid Said um, was this young man who died after being beaten by police forces. So there was a lot of domestic pushback and rage of people like because of such an injustice. And so there was, um, I think it's uh, Wael Gonim, who was, uh, or is, uh, a Google executive, he created this page anonymously as a in memoriam um, to Khalid Zayed. Um, but it gained so much support and popularity that it went from 230 followers to 230,000 users before the Egyptian revolution. And it turned into basically a platform for dissenters to just speak their thoughts and ultimately um, rise for the Egyptian revolution. It's also really important to note that with Facebook, one of the like powerful proponent or components of it was that it also uses Arabic, so it's not like they have to use like translate into English. So it's very much a like common identity. Um, there's no barriers. And finally, um, another success of social media is the rise of the citizen journalist. So before I go into the next slide, I'm going to put a little bit of content warning because the next slide does show an image of police brutality. Um, and so just to define citizen journalists, it's basically if a normal person just goes out, takes their cell phone, takes a picture, a video. And in the, in the context of the Egyptian revolution, a lot of protesters did just that. They were able to go on the ground and videotape, live stream what was going on, spread it to their friends, and gather support for people to also come and join them on the street. And so... Um, that's kind of cool because it's like it eliminates the middleman. You don't have like this skewed news crew coming in, or you don't have all, you have don't have to follow all these processes in order to get the news out there. It's just a citizen. Um, and so one particular powerful incident was um, the girl with the blue bra. And so this is an image of a female protester violently beaten by police forces during 
the revolution. Um, and the only identification is her bright blue bra, which is a very powerful statement. Like you can clearly see um, the brutal acts going on. And so this was twofold in its, I guess, um, aid in the revolution. One, it gained a lot of domestic support for the revolution, particularly from female protesters. And so after this, it kind of um, increased the prioritization of furthering women's rights. This is just one example. This was also happening numerous numerous other times during the revolution, but this was like the, fr the only captured snapshot of it um, before other uh, snapshots. And so because of this, it sparked so much female support that it's actually recorded um, during this time the largest amount of female supporters on the streets of Tahrir Square. Um, second, it also gained international um, attention. So CNN, Reuters, non-governmental organizations like the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, they saw this and they were also able to put their thoughts out there, put their resources um, as, as well as gain um, more attention into like the oppression of the police as well as um, President Mubarak. So here are some of the effects of social media I've also previously mentioned. Um, one, the norm of protesting. Because of social media, you could see other people who are protesting on the streets, thereby you see like other representations of it and you would like to join. So there's, it's normalizing protesting. Um, the second was of course uh, protesting women's rights, or protecting women's rights, I'm so sorry. Um, and also women protesters on the streets. And finally, um, domestic and international mobilization on the, on the ground as well as abroad. But there's also another thing to note with all of these things with social media is the government's reaction. And on January 27th to February 2nd, the government decided to shut down the internet. So as you can see from this graph, lots and lots of internet activity. And then all of a sudden, January 27th, 90% of it gets cut down for a few days. And then it finally gets back on February 2nd. But clearly, this is an authoritarian, authoritarian um, country's re reaction to try and, of course, curb dissent, um, which gained a lot of pushback from the people. It also, I mean, also constituents um, had other means to like try and subvert this um, internet silence, but um, it was still pretty hard. So long term, if you look at social media and how it like really mobilized people for the movement, if you compare it to to what Egypt is now in 2017 didn't necessarily evoke permanent change, unfortunately. So after President Mohammed or President Mubarak, we had um, Mohammed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he it entered into the most un, one of the most unstable parts of like government history in Egypt. Lots of corruption. He tried to um, he tried to like increase his powers. He tried to instate people from the Muslim Brotherhood. But eventually he was ousted in 2013. But the guy after him wasn't necessarily better. His name is General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He was the leader of the, oh dear. Of the military and under his rule, it's from a lot of the literature, it's about equivalent or even worse than President Mubarak from before, um, simply because he's increased a lot of the crackdown on dissent. A few of the things that he's done um, are listed below. He's decreased a lot of press freedom. Um, a lot of the constitutional changes that are in the current constitution, such as Article 71, crack down on dissenting language in the media, um, as well as he's also instated an interagency body, uh, inter body to monitor online activity. Um, and I'll just keep going really quickly. The uh, second one is um, censorship in China. And so President Xi Jinping, um, who's the current leader of China, has created this policy of cyber sovereignty, which emphasizes strict um, cyber governance. And there are a few things um, within it. One is the Great Firewall of China, which kind of has a lot of like algorithms and certain um, sensors to see like certain words in websites that are dissenting towards the government. Um, so there's a lot, it's very complex, the system, and not as much literature out there be of it because of the secu like how secure, um, security and secret it is. 
Um, the second is high government interference in social media in two ways. One, the 50 Cent Party, uh, which is Wu Mao Dong. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. But they basically pay people to pretend to be like normal social media users. Um, 50 cents for every post that they put out there that's pro-government or disruptive of any like assembly of uh, certain dissenters. Um, and so it's very um, deceptive to the public because it shows like, oh, there's like lots of popular um, pro-CCP uh, rhetoric out there, but it's not true. Um, second, they also, the government is also, um, they have these policies that they force companies like Facebook, internet content providers to actually go in to their own websites and self-censor. So it's top down, not necessarily just like from their, from up just the government, but also from the companies themselves. So because of that, it's led to a lot of companies being blacklisted because a lot of companies don't, especially Western, don't necessarily want to do that. So here's just a list of some of the companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, um, and when they stopped being accessible in China, purely because of these um, censorship policies. However, although these SNSs or social networking sites have been banned, there's also been a rise of homegrown Chinese alternative SNSs, which are on the right. So they're kind of equivalent, except, I mean, their functions are equivalent, but they're still highly regulated by the government. So it's not the same. And so in my paper, I actually argue that although China does have a public sphere, it's a pseudo public sphere because of this high government interference. Um, although there are still ways for uh, Chinese um, netizens to circumvent the system. And one way is the nuances of the Chinese language. Um, so for example, Weibo, which is the Chinese version of Twitter, um, it also has the 140 character count. But the thing about Chinese is that you can, in literally like two characters, you can say like a phrase. Um, and in this case in particular, the, the word that would be censored is freedom. I don't know how to pronounce it. But it looks similar to the other character, which would literally translate to I feel. And so there's like these really clever, innovative ways for um, people who, are, who want to speak their mind um, in China and like maybe say dissenting comments um, to still like work their way through it. But again, it's also much more of a hassle. Um, and so also, I also go into my paper really quickly. During the Egyptian revolution, there was also a revolution in China, although on a much smaller scale, called the Jasmine Revolution. Um, and they were, it was supposed to be like people congre congregating in front of McDonald's, um, but it was, it ultimately was a failure because not a lot of people, a lot of people were afraid to protest, as well as um, a lot of the government censorship policies um, were so strong that it, kind of cracked down uh, immediately when there was a call for a revolt um, here. And they like, uh, there was a lot of censorship, um, uh, what you call it? Uh, they were trying to look for words like Jasmine or today or protest already very early on in advance that by the time it did come to the day for people to protest, it had already been cracked down. And so ultimately, some conclusions and takeaways from my research are first, the quantity of social media users is not indicative of social media supposed democratize, democratizing phenomenon. So what I mean by that is Egypt actually has less SNS users than China, but they were more successful in mobilizing. So it's not necessarily a guarantee that if China has more people, um, it would be more successful, simply because China also has stronger um, censorship policies. Second, um, social media on like all sides does empower people by allowing them to, of course, to converse, exchange ideas, um, even if in a, a bit a roundabout way, like in China. And finally, um, social media and group mobilizations, um, if they're not backed by like solid organizations or plan for implementing change, like in Egypt, then ultimately it's it's too much of an imperfect system right now that democratization is likely to fail. Um, so ultimately, social media does have a strong potential to promote change, um, but there are a lot of things that need to be checked off, like universal internet penetration, um, as well as you know, other things that do need to come through first before democratization would come through from internet technology and social media. Thank you. <laughs>
any questions? So I know that you said that uh, Egypt has fewer SMS users. Mm -hmm. Does it have a higher density? Uh, is, is density proportionate to mobilization? Or? So one thing that I didn't mention in here was that the success of social media in Egypt was also because of its strong, like, young population. There's a lot of youth in there, so they have already the technological know-how to use the limited, limited social media um, that they have. Um, so it's aspects like age, the population, the age of the population that also factor into how strong social media can be in the mobilization of the populace. Questions from the audience? Is there a reason why you didn't look at the United States as a case study? Um, well, because I was more interested in like, the international aspect and I'm uh, international politics focused for my concentration. Um, as well as there's already a lot of rhetoric for like, I mean, this is also conducted before like Trump for, for me. So I was more like, um, more focused on like the international aspect of it. Yes. Do you know of any or find any censorship in the US internet? Um, I think that it's subtle. It's not necessarily as strong as China by any means, but I do, feel that the, um, the United States government does have the capacity to censor things um, if there was ever a case where they needed to censor something. Because there are um, governmental agencies that do monitor um, like the virtual aspect of, um, uh, I think it's the CIA, not the CIA, but, but yeah, like in essence I do believe that it could happen, um, but it's not necessarily talked about. Yeah. Go for it. I recently read that um, Facebook is planning to hire like a thousand people to monitor content for people that are going to like live stream uh, like killing people or brutal acts or posts about brutal acts like that. And I'm wondering if you gave any thought to like the inverse effect of social media to uh, amplify um, acts that are, you know, like counter things that we want to promote. So you're saying as like Facebook and social media is turning into more of like a noose or like... Like there was a recent case of, of like a guy that murdered somebody and face like live streamed the murder and is to like get attention. Right. Right. Um, you could imagine uh, people who are attention seeking in that way future instances of this. I mean, that's true. I mean, I feel like, um, yes, social media could be used like that. I mean, they also use it to like live stream, for example, like police brutality and that kind of thing. So I do believe that social media already is being used as like some sort of like, um, like evidence for crimes, et cetera. But if you're trying, are you asking like, could it be used in more like a terrorist aspect of like? Are you? Are yeah, are you concerned that uh, somebody could come along and in the way that we've seen people come up with very intelligent ways to uh, mount pro-democracy revolutions on social media, mm -hmm. you could also uh, mount, uh, you know, very harmful... I mean, yeah, um, yes, yeah. of course. Like, there's always a risk with this type of, like, content um, information sharing um, tools that it could have the potential to, I guess, like adversely affect um, what people think or how people feel or just movements in general. All right, thank you. All Hello. Hi. Hi. 
Hello, my name is Aureli again. Um, this is my ethnic studies capstone, which I wanted to share with y'all just because it's been kind of like a year or so researching this topic of like respectability politics and how it affects like people and how like we engage with it. Um, and yeah, I look forward to like just talking about it with y'all. So the title of it is called Cease to Resist, How Policy Perpetuates Respectability Within Marginalized Groups. Um, and there's a few things that I want to like, a few distinctions and definitions that I want to make before we start out. Um, first of all, in terms of marginalized groups, I want to define them as those whose opinions and experiences um, and ways of living um, and histories as well have intentionally been relegated to the margin of what we consider to be historical and or important. Um, and in terms of like policy that I'm looking at, I'm looking at social policy that deals with granting rights on and or benefits to people um, that were previously inaccessible to them before. So that's the kind of like policy that I'm looking at and the groups of people that are being affected by like, the respectability that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, yes, so, and I also wanna define respectability politics, um, which is a strategy that encourages the adoption of the manners and morality of a dominant culture in order to counter negative views of a racial, ethnic, or cultural group um, in order to receive better treatment from the dominant group. So it's ways that we adapt, the way, adapt to like, you know, how we interact with each other, how we live in order to receive more benefits, in order to receive a better treatment from like, people that we deem to be in power or that we look up to. Um, so that. So, I wanted to start off with this image, um, which is from a comic book called X-Men God Loves Man Kills, which was published in 1982. Um, and to your <coughs> left is a person called Reverend William Stryker, who is a very big Christian figure within the comic, comic book world of the X-Men. Um, and for those that are not familiar with the X-Men comic book, the X-Men are basically hum like people who were born with a mutation in their genes that give them these like superhuman abilities, right? So for example, some people might be able to like freeze, like throw like freezing powers or have like, you know, like heating powers. This particular person here, his, uh, mut his mutant name is Nightcrawler and he's able to like teleport and do like a lot of like gymnastic things just because he was born with these abilities, right? And he's obviously a kind of mutant that is not able to pass as a regular human being. And this is a big conflict within like the X-Men world where certain mutants are able to like pass as regular human beings, but certain mutants are not able to pass as regular human beings. So in this particular interaction, we have Reverend William Stryker, who's a very big opponent of the X-Men being integrated within society or being accepted within society, saying, human, you dare call that thing human. And the reason why I wanted to start off with this image is because a lot of my research looks into how this idea of respectability politics creates this like us and them between people who are deemed respectable and people who are deemed non-respectable. So we have folks that are able to fit within like the large narrative of like society who are able to like follow laws and live the life kind of life that's deemed normal or traditional. And then we have folks that are not able to fit that narrative for various reasons, whether it be because of systems of oppression that affect them or just because they choose not to accept that form of living, right? Um, so these are some questions that I wanted to like, that frame my research. So how do policies established by state and institutional actors perpetuate respectability within marginalized groups? So that's kind of like my title, right? Um, and I focus specifically on policies uh, established by the state and institutional actors because these are the people that I deem to be in power and that I deem to have the most control over how like society within the United States functions. Um, how does respectability manifest itself within marginalized groups that seek to gain a benefit from policy? So once a policy is passed by the government, how do people shape the way that they deal with each other in order to gain the benefit from this policy? Um, and relatedly, what type of effect does this have over marginalized people? So once people have changed the ways that they interact with each other, what effect does that have with how they interact with the rest of the community, right? Is it a positive effect? Is it a negative effect? Um, and that's really what my research is, is trying to look at and, and trying to deem. And what I did in terms, in, in order to do that, was that I took policies um, such as DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, 
um, which was passed by the Obama administration in 2012. And I try to s see the ways that people who are, are able to like, benefit from policies such as this um, have to, in a way, shape that, the way that they interact with their own communities, but also shape, shape their narratives in order to fit with something that would allow them to benefit from it. So DACA is a really good example, and I'm going to be using this as kind of like my main case study for today. Because um, DACA requires, uh, so basically, it's the Fair Action for Childhood Arrivals means that it gives low priority to people who arrive to the United States undocumented, um, arrived as children, and have good behavior. So basically, if you don't have a criminal record, um, if you've been a student your entire life, right, um, if you are able to prove that like you have good grades and are like trying to make like a feasible um, economic like contribution to the United States, then DACA is something that like is accessible to you. Um, but without these like kind of pre-requirements, you are not able to qualify. And so that's where this idea of like respectability comes in and like how I connect it to my research in that students are forced to like become these superhuman like superhuman like achievers in order to access things that all undocumented students should be able to access whether you have a 2.5 gpa or you have a 4.8 gpa if you want to study you should be i i my position is that you should be able to study right but unless you are able to have these pre-requirements you are not able to like qualify for low priority are not able to be eligible for the work permits that this gives you and are not able to continue like uh, have a much easier time uh, pursuing higher education within the United States. Um, and something that I wanted to point out was this article from the LA Times, which came out a few months ago. Um, and it kind of shows the ways that like communities have started changing the language that they use in order to make sure that like they are seeming like respectable, they are seeming like they are the ones that want to fit in. So by the LA Times. DACA is a very, very difficult subject for me, Trump conceded during a rambling East Room news conference Thursday, promising to address the issue with heart. It's one of the most difficult subjects I have because you have these incredible kids, and the emphasis is by me. Um, and though few immigration advocates have a direct connection with the new administration because they are largely seen as allied with Democrats, several Latino evangelical leaders believe their conversations with Trump's transition team, along with their prayers, help shape the White House's considerations. The pastors urged Trump advisors to have some grace and mercy for the dreamers. These were sons and daughters of families and congregations across the country, members of their communities they explained during a conference call in November, in December, sorry. So this is like a very good example of something that I would tag in terms of like how respectability forces people to like shape the way that we see, shape the way that we like try to live and shape the way that we try to like engage with um, our own communities. So for example, these are the sons and daughters of families and congregations, right? What if these were not the sons and daughters of people in congregations, right? Who is being excluded when we're trying to talk about certain people that belong in like these labels or like categories? Um, and Another thing that I wanted to know is that like this is also like an uh, evangelical or like religious groups that are trying to like advocate for people, um, and like in my previous picture, right, we had like someone who's like a religious figure as well trying to like make this distinction between like who is human and who is not. These folks are, although they are coming with good intentions in terms of like, advocating for like people that like are in their congregation that are doing like, have good grades that are like being dedicated students, they are also while they are trying to advocate for those students, they are also like excluding students who do not fit the definition or who do not, um, yeah, who are not like part of their community circles. So this is where this idea of like exclusion comes in within my research. Um, and I just want to give a few of uh, I, a few points of my takeaways. So within like the case studies that I use, which is DACA is one of them. Respectability, in, in my conclusions, encourages a, figura a figurative and a literal divide between people viewed as deviants, non-traditional, and those viewed as respectable. So I say a, figur a figurative divide because obviously like, people aren't like, creating like, physical borders or whatever between themselves, but it's a literal divide as well because 
people are actively saying we want to be, you know, we don't want to be grouped by, with them. We don't want to be like, um, uh, you know, like we don't want to be related like with them in, in the sort of like communal aspect. Um, and I do, I want to make a connection kind of to Sam's research in terms of like perverse incentives because you, you talk about it, Sam, in the way of like profit, right, like monetary profit. But I think I look at this in the way of like, in, in a cultural and a social way be, where policy creates this like perverse incentive for people to like change the way that they interact with each other and become respectable in order to fit in and gain benefits from uh, policies. So that is one of my takeaways as well. And my final thing as like a policy person as well, like I wanna like think about ethical policy and like, or policy that like does not encourage these kind of like divisions within communities. Um, and I, one of my takeaways was like trying to look for like policies that like, you know, don't encourage these divisions within communities. And something that I was looking at, um, something that's happening here in Providence recently is like the Community Safety Act, right? It's a, an act that was put together by a lot of grassroots organizations, um, which means that like the people who are involved within these organizations are the people being directly affected by the issues that um, are happening in the Providence community. So when you put folks that are being directly impacted and you try to include everyone as much as possible, you, I think, are trying to like create policy and acts um, and laws that do not shape, do, are not shaped to like create divisions, but instead to like benefit <coughs> everyone. Um, because if like you do, you know, if you're trying to benefit the person who's like the most affected and oppressed, then you're, I think it's also a benefit for like the person who's like a little bit oppressed and like not as like um, affected by the issue. Um, and yeah, I, I also just wanted to, another takeaway is that I think creating this type of ethical policy and like inclusive um, policy is, is hard work and then sometimes unimaginable, but I think that's kind of the kind of work that I want to work towards um, after I leave my time here at Brown. So, thank you. All right, questions from the audience? All right. So, so you talk about respectability as something that people try to conform to in order to be able to access policies. I'm wondering about the reverse of people not able to access policies be, uh, because they don't want to conform or, like, or because it doesn't seem like it's meant for them. Like I'm thinking of, um, I, had a, I was in a meeting with um, the director of PRISM Mm -hmm. which is an organization off campus and this was just a day or two after they had a really terrible hate-filled vandalism incident and I'm like oh my god are you okay and you know, they said yeah you know we're we're getting by and I said well were the Providence police helpful he's like I'm not gonna talk to the Providence police why do I want to talk to the Providence police they you know everything we do is about having less of them in our lives um, and that was like really striking to me. Yeah, and I think that's an example, right, of like a group of people or community who's act like um, intentionally deciding not to be a part of like something that that holds a lot of power, um, which is like a little bit different from a policy, but it definitely, right? Like that's it's an interaction that's intentional and and active, and it's it's also a sacrifice because when you don't engage with these institutions that like hold power. Right, you don't gain the so-called benefits that they bring as well. Um, and for PRISM, being policed is not a benefit. Therefore, that's why they're not interacting with them. Um, but yeah, power to PRISM for you know, doing their own stuff and like trying to come up with like, uh, policies and, and solutions to, to the issue of police brutality and police accountability by like, engaging with the youth themselves. So that's a cool organization that y'all should check out. Yeah. Um, first, I want to compliment you on two things. One, the use of the X-Men allegory. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the X-Men comics, and I think they're such um, an underrated allegory mm -hmm. for civil rights. Same. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and second, I also want to compliment you on choosing DACA, which is a, a policy that is very dear to me and people in my community. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I was also wondering about how advocacy groups, how you recommend advocacy groups um, negotiate respectability politics. Um, I'm also aware that the California Dream Network, which unites all of the AB 540 and, and Dreamer grassroots organizations in the state of California, mm -hmm. um, intentionally aligns itself with this Dreamer like immigrant exceptionalism narrative. Mm -hmm. um, with the rationale that this is the only way to get through to conservative policymakers and make sure that as few young people get deported as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you recommend negotiating that tension? Yeah, I think that, thank you thank you for bringing that up because that was a very big like issue that I felt myself contending with in terms of the research is that obviously groups do this. I feel like some groups do this not because they want to, but because they have to, right, in order to benefit from, from like these policies. Um, and. I think there's, but there, I think there can be a distinction between strategically using, right, like respectability in order to gain a benefit for a community and also like completely buying into this narrative, right? Because once you start buying into it and you start, like you have members within your organization that are listening to you and are trusting you with what you're telling them, right? The information that you're giving them. And once you're filtering down that narrative, then that's how people start changing the way that they interact with each other. And that's like also like part of my research in looking how like this idea of respectability kind of trickles down right into like one to one interactions. Um, I actually I before I did my research on like policy, I had done something on like looking how social movements and organizations en engage with respectability, and that was a big takeaway. Like I think being strategic, being intentional, but also being honest with your community members and saying. Like we're going to be doing this because we we want to give you some wins and some benefits, you know. But I also think that we want to also be clear that we're not trying to leave behind folks that like you know might be in prison or folks that like you know might uh, be using drugs. It's like it's about making sure that we can have small steps and small wins in order for like a larger victory. Um, but that that would be like a recommendation, right? It's not like everyone's doing that. Yeah. Okay. Final questions. So I, uh, for a couple of reasons, and I'll address the main one in a bit, do not have slides, so I'm just going to hang out here. Uh, I want to, I'm also very cognizant of the time, so um, absolutely, if you feel like you have questions that aren't able to be answered afterwards, or you want to talk more about this, just pull me aside. I want to start by uh, thank you, thanking um, Sam and Christine and Arelli for sharing your research. I think this is a very interesting panel in that it is uh, multidisciplinary. I do not have policy recommendations. I uh, am going to pose some interesting issues and not tell you really what I think should happen. But I uh, study public health and anthropology, and I have loved doing the combination because I think they look at similar issues from very different lenses. For my research, um, I decided to look at heroin abuse in Rhode Island. And there's something of a stigma against doing anthropology at home. And um, I had to really, really negotiate being in a space where absolutely I'm not familiar with a lot. I'm from southeastern Connecticut, though, Westerly, Rhode Island, where my entire family lives, um, has a overdose death rate that is more than twice the national average. And um, as I got older and had friends go to rehab and saw people dying and realized uh, you know, how much it really, really crosses different communities, I was interested in looking at something I cared about deeply on a personal level in an academic sense. So. Um, what I ended up doing was spending a lot of time. I'm going to use pseudonyms. It's uh, pretty clear if you know anything about the landscape, where the places are, but uh, just to be on the safe side. I spent a lot of time uh, at two programs run through Thompson Hospital, which is the only hospital in the state of Rhode Island that focuses uh, predominantly on child and adolescent psychiatric issues and uh, at Rising Tides, which is a peer-to-peer -peer recovery center in Pawtucket. And uh, just approached the 
uh, places with the idea that I would be looking at the trajectory from opioid painkiller to heroin use. And it turned out that that's not what I ended up looking at. But a lot of what I thought, uh, a lot of the questions that I had remained extremely relevant. What I'm going to talk about today uh, focuses on manipulation and modulation in environments. As I was looking at my field notes, I was trying to figure out how they all piece together. And what I found is uh, that in a population that is often conjectured to not have control, I mean, everyone's heard of the addict spiraling out of control who's no longer themselves. Uh, there are very real and um, effective efforts to exert control through different temporal spaces in the way that people tell their narratives, in the way that those narratives are extremely dynamic, in the way that people interact with their environments and especially in the way that people envision and plan their futures. None of those things are static. Uh, they change as people move through recovery, but um, they provided a really interesting framework to explore ideas about power and who holds that power. For my analysis, I uh, focused pretty heavily on Foucault, who wrote uh, in Psychiatric Power about the idea of modulation, and then Todd Myers, who's a contemporary anthropologist who uh, writes about modulation in a pharmacotherapy sense, and uh, outside of that as well. Uh, one of his pieces, The Clinic and Elsewhere, was extremely informative. So uh, I'll just share a couple of anecdotes that I think illustrate these points better than um, necessarily going into theory would. So as far as narrative past goes, um, Rising Tides was home to different NA and AA meetings. And uh, when you start to spend time in NA meetings, you start to see the patterns of language that are there. Uh, it's a pretty prescribed procedure. Uh, there's a lot of talk about hitting rock bottom. There's um, a lot of talk about uh, that turning point. Um, and it also becomes a space for people to air their grievances with one another, uh, within the organizations. Stanley Brandis has written about this uh, really fantastically in Staying Sober in Mexico City. But uh, I had a conversation with a man, um, I'll call him Matthew, who came up to me extremely ecstatic after his first time giving a testimonial. And he emphasized that he'd been going to meetings every day, he'd listened to people talk a lot, and he thought that he knew how to do it now which is an interesting use of language because, I mean, the idea of telling your own story, there's clearly a how in this context. But uh, as we continued talking, there was another man, uh, Jeremy, who spent a lot of time there, and he came over and started to talk to Matthew. And in something that wasn't entirely unusual, they sort of had an almost nostalgic exercise where they were talking about uh, all the things they'd stolen, and the things that they, um, the sort of trouble they'd gotten into, and had you been to this prison, had you been to this space, and nostalgia and regret really uh, existed together, uh, which was interesting and not something I necessarily would have expected. That particular encounter was extremely performative. They were speaking to each other, but they were angled towards me. I felt like <laughs> I was watching a theater performance that would occasionally, especially Jeremy, sort of look over to make sure I was still paying attention. Um, and then as far as navigating the presence, present, uh, I just always think of this one woman, Jan, who uh, um, suffered from schizophrenia and was a recovering heroin addict. And you knew the moment that Jan walked into the space because there were constant demands. She asked us for stamps every day. We never had stamps. I think Jan knew that we never had stamps. I learned how to make her tea very quickly. She would not actually tell you what she wanted in her tea. So through trial and error of making the tea incorrectly many times, I discovered what Jan liked. And uh, as I got to know her better, I discovered that this was really the only space that she had, and the only space that she had where she could put those demands forward and they would be honored. Uh, she had been banned from the public library for being a nuisance. She no longer lived with her husband. 
And uh, shortly after that encounter, she was actually arrested for asking her neighbors for money to pay her rent. But within that space, um, even if we occasionally rolled our eyes, she was always met with respect. And she told us once that she felt like she was lonely, like she was a duck swimming in cold water. But she came back to rising tides almost every single day. The future became interesting in how people conceptualized their future substance use, uh, particularly conversations around marijuana and around methadone. Um, a lot of the teens that I saw through the Thompson programs, um, I was at a step-down facility called Open Hearts, and a home-based services program would uh, talk pretty constantly about how they saw marijuana as the only uh, thing that had ever been effective as far as medication goes. And it really was reminiscent of Meyer's description of uh, teens in a methadone program actually creating a schedule and kind of co-opting clinical language of when they would take uppers and when they would take the Suboxone and when they would take heroin. Um, and creating that sort of schedule for themselves they were pretty sure that as long as they could have marijuana, they would not escalate. And typically their parents disagreed with that. And so it was the role of the clinician to kind of navigate that relationship. And methadone surprised me in how contentious methadone, suboxone, any sort of medication assisted treatment really surprised me in how contentious it was. Um, it, I found you actually couldn't bring it up at Rising Tides. The one time I saw someone do it, they brought it up in an NA meeting and it escalated into physical conflict. Um, because people had very different ideas about whether that counted. And then you have to start to ask the question, uh, what's the issue? How is it conceptualized? Is the issue substance use at all? Is the issue the um, social stigma that comes from substance use? Is the issue the consequences where people are engaging in uh, violent or disruptive acts as a result of substance use. And uh, unless we think critically about those issues, I mean, we're gonna have the same spiral over and over. And I'm gonna leave you with one final story. Uh, we were doing a letter writing activity at Open Hearts where the uh, master's student instructed the students to write a letter to themselves one year in the future. And uh, some of the kids sort of misunderstood the assignment, but one boy in particular um, believed, I'm, I'm so sorry, it was 10 years in the future. Some of them took it as one year in the future and wrote something more akin to that. One boy believed that that meant that he would be there for 10 years. Um, and so ended up writing a list of just rules that uh, like the staff are only trying to help you the staff are right, don't talk back to staff. It was extremely proud of this and to put this forward, but uh, it was a very explicit example of how he had learned to modulate his behavior to the institution, how he had learned to navigate through the institution. And um, I, I just saw that multiple times as far as the co-opting of language goes. I heard a lot of talk of peer negativity and coping skills uh, coupled with more juvenile situations. So I don't really have answers, and I am extremely eager to talk more about this with anyone who's interested. But since we've had so many uh, extended conversations, I do think having a wrap-up is extremely important. So I'm going to leave space for any questions you might have right now and uh, a concluding discussion. So before the concluding discussion, any questions specifically for Liz? And the Audience or the other panelists? Yeah, I, I do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering two things. Uh, first, if you could talk about the the ethics of doing ethnographic research with a very vulnerable population, <laughs> and what your IRB approval process was like, or if you had to go through one. So I actually did not have to go through the IRB um, because I was doing thesis research, and uh, also because I was coordinating with a um, clinician at Bradley who did her own IRB process to sort of let me through. The ethical um, 
questions really plagued me a lot. And I said I would address why I don't have a slide. I think that um, photography can be a very valuable part of ethnography. I mean, if you read Righteous Dope Fiend, it's incredible. But uh, it took me enough <laughs> uh, trust building exercises to really be able to speak with people candidly. I mean, part of the reason I didn't address the question I set out to address was it took me, I would say, about four months of showing up consistently before people were ready to discuss anything similar to that. And that includes staff members because the whole setting of uh, Rising Tides in particular is such that the staff and the volunteers have been through the recovery process themselves. I really underestimated that trust building going in. Uh, I was a little bit confused when no one would really talk to me for three weeks, but as I, as I wrote, I, I had that question a lot and uh, became frustrated sometimes by the idea that, you know, I was putting these things forward and how is this actually affecting people and was it creating any sort of positive change? I sat in on therapy sessions. I mean, the best thing I can think of, and this might be a justification to myself, is that um, when you're a residency, even if you don't know what you're doing, you have to you have to do procedures. Like you just have to, or you'll never learn. I uh, this was my first procedure, and I hope that uh, through it, I did justice to the people that. Um, were willing to share their lives with me. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Um, I'm wondering how your background in anthropology and public health have sort of prepared you for this and how they like sort of haven't prepared you for this yeah. um, as like someone who also like is in public health mm -hmm. and like we do things together. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering like what sort of... Um, like recommendations you would see going forward for like students that want to do this type of research and like how do they navigate um, like approaching such a topic um, whether or not they feel supported by those like departments. Yeah absolutely so uh, what was really critical to me being able to do this at all was that I had been volunteering I mean you know at Hasbro and uh, also at Macaulay House and even though I didn't have relationships necessarily with people at Rising Tides at that point, um, the associations I had through other community organizations was huge. So I think just getting involved as early as possible. And uh, we talked a little bit. I was in a panel yesterday because uh, I'm doing a gist that surrounds a uh, homeless narrative. Respect and honesty and approaching every single community relationship that way. Public health is fantastic, but Catherine Mason, who's in the anthropology department and wrote about the uh, SARS epidemic in China, has pointed out that, um, I mean, it's really a science for the greater good, and that can really diminish human integrity sometimes and uh, individualism, whereas I think anthropology is really focused on um, those relationships with people and seeing people as individuals. So I guess the best advice I have is to honor people's integrity and uh, to be extremely honest and transparent about what you don't know. And if you go into those relationships with an attitude of curiosity and uh, respect, I think that's the only way that you can gain that sort of knowledge. Um, so at Rising Tides, almost everyone was voluntary. Um, some of them were required to do community service or to attend meetings, and uh, that was a space where they could do that. Um, as far as the Thompson programs go, I would say the majority of people that I worked with, it was voluntary by their parents and voluntary by the adolescents. Uh, however, some of the adolescents are court ordered to treatment. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, what I learned from listening to all of you together 
was um, there were other themes other than the questions you had earlier about like uh, the individual and institutions. So um, I really appreciated the framework of really of respectability because I actually think that kind of plays out for all of you in terms of both the literal term but the sort of irony that inherent in that term as well. Um, I guess I wanted to ask all of you to reflect on um, kind of what you pose for us, sort of um, in terms of respectability versus authenticity, institutions versus the individual, agency, data, stories, you know, kind of when doing this all together, what you're thinking about now. Because data is always presented as a counterpoint to storytelling, right? Like for example, sort of in some ways data is prioritized or privileged or seen as somehow more better proof than stories, you know. Um, but what is what is maybe the relationship between the two that you're hearing in a different way? Um, this thing about voice, this thing about... I mean, I just think that it's essential to mix the two. Um, yeah. I think that even in the hard sciences, you have to be able to see the implications that that's gonna have on real people and um, constantly being evaluate, constantly evaluating what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated being with people who are looking at policy and people who are looking at data um, because I think that collaboration is key and uh, those relationships are key. My thesis advisor, uh, Ross Chait, um, pushed me in a lot of directions and pushed me hard on the public policy literature. Um, I think Professor Chait, you know, I'm, I'm a double with econ and policy and he's really law and policy and, and, and I think that added that that did teach me a lot, but unfortunately, I think it also taught me a lot about all the things that I wasn't able to do, and the things that were lacking more than, you know, there, there's a there's a concept of the street level bureaucrat, um, you know, uh, elected bodies legislate, street level bureaucrats implement, and the sum of actions taken by street level bureaucrats is really policy. Um, so I did a lot of reading on the SLV literature, so to speak, and I, I do think it's critical because you know you have to remember when you're when I'm when I'm talking about court fines, uh, you, for, you know, stop for a moment and think about the power dynamic. Uh, you have you have a person who's coming into an office speaking behind speaking to somebody behind a double pane bulletproof glass window, right? you know, with an armed guard somewhere, if, it, if it's a courthouse, right? Um, there's, a, there's a great book, uh, Cops, Teachers, Counselors, um, by, by two researchers, Moody and Machino, and it's basically ethnography. They basically mm -hmm. just did the ethnography of, of, of a police force, and they embedded themselves in the police force, and, uh, you know, listened to them talk to each other about, about the ways that they feel supported by the other cops or not supported, and, and how those dynamics play out. Um, a lot of literature about people, about street level bureaucrats actually trying to narrow the scope of their jobs. So if you're a court clerk and you have lots of people that come in front of you on a day-to-day -day basis saying, I can't afford this, I can't afford this. It's a lot easier for you to be able to say, standard policy is $20 payment a month. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to spend more, that standard policy, right? Now let's go. Um, and I think, so I think that that's all important. It, it, it illuminates, uh, it, 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 it tells you what's going on in between the data. Mm -hmm. The things that you can't see in the data itself, right? Um, because it's like, why are, Again, like if I could do interviews, if I had more time, it took me a year to produce everything you saw there, right? 
uh, if at another year. Like, uh, you know, why are some towns outliers? Well, maybe like Judge Joe in, in Plainsville uh, is just really not amenable to change, right? Um, there's a student who graduated last year named Rachel Black who did an outstanding thesis uh, that I think is like orders of magnitude better than what I was able to put together. Um, who wrote about court fines in Rhode Island. Um, and she wasn't, she was, she, she did a mixed methods that had interviews. And she was interested in implementation of a law that we passed here, which on its face sounds really, really good. Which is that if you uh, qualify for public benefits, Medicaid, uh, you know, Social Security Disability, uh, uh, temporary assistance, whatever, you're automatically, that is evidence enough that you should not have to pay a court fine. You're waived right out. And what Rachel found by sitting in on court hearings and talking to people incarcerated in, in uh, Adult Correctional Institute, the one jail in Rhode Island, was that systematically this law was being ignored. And that instead of judges asking about people's ability to pay, they'd say like, why are you dressed like that in my courtroom? Um, she would talk to people in, uh, in ACI and say, you know, ask them if they were aware that they were supposed to be credited $50 a night that they were in jail uh, towards the balance that they owed. And they're like, no, nobody told me that. Um, and, you know, if the computer system, like, figured out that they were supposed to be released, they'd be released. And if not, there were some big screw-ups, right? Um, this is all a securitist way of, of saying that, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, you, you need, you need, you need both things complementing one another and the feedback between the two of them to do your policy in the best way possible. You know, I borrowed from Rachel's research in my own thesis to say, uh, the state of Missouri, you know, has written a really nice form now, uh, that's supposed to waive people out of court fines. Uh, but if Rhode Island is any example, just having the form is not enough. Exactly sure how much I can add. I absolutely agree with um, what everything's been said on the panel. Um, but I do agree that um, that data always has to also accompany like storytelling. I mean, purely from the numbers, you can't see the entire picture. And like purely from I guess from my own research, um, I mean speaking I guess to the power of social media. Yes, there are a lot of numbers um, like on the screen of like how many people partake in certain things, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes like word of mouth or like other narratives, other that give more context um, and are actually much more powerful than anything that's any of the numbers that are always presented. Um, so yeah, um, I guess I'm like, yeah. Anything to add? Um, no. <laughs> uh, I think that's going to serve as the final thoughts for the panel. Um, I want to um, thank Sam, Christine, Riley, and Liz, and congratulations on your presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have final questions, would you guys willing to sit here for a few minutes if people want to come up and that? Great. Thank you.